give you some insight into why um, this homework assignment is called Linear Systems. I realized as I was you know, organizing materials and doing stuff that it might not be clear. It was very clear to me because the idea of linear systems is central to all of science and in many ways essential to the nature of our universe. So um, this is going to feel a little bit like math class because you've done it before, but sometimes we need to remind, be reminded of the skills that we obtained in the past to be able to go forward and do things in the future. Here I have two equations, equation one and equation two. 4x minus 2y equals 2, y minus x equals 1. And this is a pair of equations that looks very much like something that would have been given in my math, math class. And my math teacher would say, find x and find y. But what I realize is that if I try to use the first equation, both x and y are unknown. Indeed, in the second equation, x and y are unknown. So if I was given either one of those equations alone, it would be impossible for me to find out what x and y are. Um, and we say at that point that the system is underdetermined. But when you have two equations and two unknowns, it becomes possible to algebraically solve, provided you know the appropriate techniques. When I have as many equations as I have unknowns, this is typically referred to as a linear system. And I want to review really quick how I go about this, um, because uh, this is the skill that I need uh, to solve many very interesting physics problems. The first thing I realize here is that this first equation that I have here has a common factor of 2. I've got a 4 and a 2 and a 2. So I could simplify this equation quite a bit if I simply divided everything by 2, because there's a 2 in every term. This is not un unlike what happens in physics when there's the mass in every term. And I find that I can divide by the mass, and all of the masses go away. So that's going to be my first step, uh, dividing by 2. And so here's my new set of equations. And certainly they look a bit simpler, but I'm really no closer to solving. There are a couple of different ways to go about solving this sort of situation. The easiest one for me, the one that's most familiar, is to solve one of the equations for one of the unknowns and plug it into uh, the other equation. So what I've done is I've taken the second equation that was y minus x equals 1, and I've solved it for y. So I've written it y is equal to 1 plus x. What I'm going to do with that fact is I'm going to take that y and plug it in to the first equation. That is, in the first equation, 2x minus y equals 1. And wherever I see a y, I'm going to put 1 plus x, and that gives me um, a very, very satisfying result. 2x minus the quantity 1 plus x is equal to 0. Well, the parentheses are there just to show me that where there was a y, I put a 1 plus x. So I have 2x minus an x, which is an x, minus 1 is equal to 1. Adding 1 to the uh, right-hand side of the equation, and x equals 2. So by leveraging both equations, one against the other, by taking one equation and plugging it into the other, I was able to determine what x is equal to 2. It's very common under these circumstances that once I find out one unknown, then finding the second unknown is even easier. Once I realize that x is equal to 2, I use my previously known fact that y is equal to 1 plus x to calculate what y is. 1 plus x, where x is equal to 2, means y is equal to 3. So I started out with these two equations relating x and y. And by using my skills of linear system solution that I learned in math class, I was able to find out that x is equal to 2 and y is equal to 3. And I can check that really quick with x is equal to 2, 4 times 2 is 8, minus y equal to 3 is 2 times 3 is 6, is 8 minus 6 is 2. So that checks out. The second equation also checks out with y equals 3, 3 minus x, which is 2, is 3 minus 2 is 1. So x and y, 2 and 3 respectively, are the solutions to the problem. Linear systems analysis, when I first learned about it in math class, seems like just taking a bunch of equations and, and throwing them together. Uh, and it's just math, x and y's. But there are a lot of cases that I'll encounter in my learning where equations can be written that relate um, things that are familiar. 
in the case of physics, like tension and mass and acceleration. I write equations of physics, uh, and that's what this homework assignment is all about. So I need a problem to solve that requires this technique, and this homework assignment gives me one. Actually, gives me more than one. Here is a tricky Newton's second law problem to solve. I have a two kilogram mass sitting on top of this tabletop, and there is friction. It's got a rope attached to it, which goes over a pulley, and I have another mass, different mass, one kilogram, hanging from that pulley. Now, when I release it, the green arrow tells me what's going to happen. The one kilogram mass is going to descend, and the two kilogram mass is going to move to the right. They're going to move with a mutual acceleration. There's a couple of observations that I want to make here before I get busy solving the problem. One is that the two masses are connected by this rope. And that's what relates the two one to the other. That's what makes this a system. The rope connects the two in that the force that's exerted by the tension on the two kilogram block is caused by the tension that is created by the one kilogram block. The tension between the two kilogram block and a one kilo and the one kilogram block is an action reaction pair, according to Newton's third law, which means the tension that's exerted on the two kilogram block is equal and opposite in direction to the tension that's exerted on the one kilogram block. That means that in this problem, I won't have to say tension number one and tension number two, or tension A and tension B, because those tensions are equal to each other. I'll simply refer to them as the tension. Also, because the two blocks are connected by an inextensible cord, when the one kilogram block goes down one meter, the two kilogram block will move to the right by one meter. That is, their displacements in time are the same. And if their displacements are the same, then their velocities are the same, and their accelerations are the same. So I won't need an acceleration number one and an acceleration number two. I won't need acceleration A and acceleration B, because both of these objects have the same acceleration. All I need to proceed with my Newton's second law analysis is two thoughtfully drawn free body diagrams. And here they are. You'll notice that I'm doing everything with symbols, because everybody has different numbers anyway. Here on the left, I've drawn a free body diagram for the block that sits on the table, and I've chosen to call it uh, mass 1. So I've written an M1 on there, and it matters. Because when I draw the forces that act on mass 1, I draw its weight, m1g, directed downward. Notice that I've used m1. It's really important that I be clear about which mass that I'm talking about, or my solution is not going to work out. Um, that mass, m1, is being pulled to the right by a rope that has a tension t. Remember, there's an action-reaction thing going on here, so I don't need to say t1. It's just t, the tension, in this problem. M1 sits on the tabletop, and so there's a normal force directed upward perpendicular to the tabletop N. I'm also told in the problem statement that it's subject to some kinetic friction force as it drags along the tabletop. So I've included a friction force directed to the left, kinetic friction force, that opposes the motion of block 1. On the right, I have a free body diagram for block 2, which is much simpler. Notice when you look at the picture that block 2 doesn't touch the... Um, uh, doesn't touch the, any kind of wall or surface or anything, so there's no normal force, and since there's no normal force, there's no contact, there can't be any friction. So M2 is a very simple free body diagram. It's weight, M2G, directed downward, and the tension directed upward, the very same tension that acts on the block that moves horizontally. Now, I want to look at the left-hand free body diagram again and apply Newton's second law. One of the things I like to do at this point, since I already have some experience doing Newton's laws, is to look at the vertical direction and realize that according to this free body diagram, the normal force directed upward must be equal to the weight, m1g, directed downward. So I'm not going to write Newton's second law for the vertical direction. I'm simply going to write that n is equal to m1g. I need to know that normal force because I'm going to need to include a little bit of friction in my calculation. Now, Newton's second law for the horizontal direction. The tension in the direction of motion minus the friction force opposing the motion is equal to m1a. It's really important that I put that m1 there because I have two masses in the problem and I don't want to get confused. 
The tension minus the friction is equal to M1A. That friction force, like all friction forces, is the coefficient of friction mu multiplied by the normal force. But of course, the normal force is M1G. So I'm going to jump a few steps ahead here and write my final equation for the horizontal motion of block number one as the tension force minus mu M1G equals M1A. Now I want to point out, there are two unknowns in this equation. The tension in the rope and the acceleration. So if I just gave, and everything else is known, mu is known, M1 is known, G is known. If I just gave you this equation and said, what's the acceleration? You would say, I can't possibly know that. Because I don't know what the tension is. I can't know what the acceleration is. Similarly, if I asked you to find the tent, find the uh, acceleration, well, I'm sorry, if I asked you to find the tension, you would say, you didn't give me the acceleration, so I can't answer. One equation will not do. Luckily, I have a second free body diagram. So my free body diagram on the right, I'll apply Newton's second law. Here's a point where you have to be very careful. This is crucial. For this free body diagram, I have to choose positive to be downward, which is not, you know, might be counter to some of your instincts. The reason why I have to do that is because I've claimed that they have the same acceleration. If I'm going to do that, I have to write my equation in a way that assures me that the accelerations will have not only the same magnitude, but the same sign. And so what you want to do in problems of this type is choose the direction of motion to be the positive direction. The block that's on the table moved to the right, so I chose to the right to be the positive direction. The block hanging moves downward, so I choose downward to be the positive direction. As such, when I write Newton's second law for the second block, M2G directed downward minus the tension directed upward, see I'm saying the tension's in a negative direction and M2G's in the positive direction, is equal to M2A. And I find myself in the same predicament. This equation, M2G minus T equals M2A, has two unknowns. The tension is unknown and the acceleration is unknown. So just using this one equation, I can't solve. However, just like the algebraic example at the beginning of the video, I have two equations and I have two unknowns. In my example at the beginning of the video, the unknowns were x and y. Here, the unknowns are t and a. Linear systems analysis solves this problem. I've taken it quite a ways. Let's get the numbers in there. Set it down on paper, plug one equation into the other, and solve out for the unknown acceleration and the unknown tension. Here's another excellent example from our homework assignment of two objects that interact one with the other. Uh, and I can write Newton's second law for one and Newton's second law for the other, and that creates a system of equations that I solve simultaneously to get my answer. So um, here I have a mass m on the uh, left-hand side hanging. It's drawn smaller, so I imagine it's a, it's a lesser mass, and 100 kilograms on the right-hand side, and a distance of one meter. The one meter is there because I'm told that this, mass, this thing is going to uh, accelerate to the table over a distance of one meter in a certain amount of time, uh, or over a certain amount of time. Okay, well, that's going to change my answer to this, but anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, and I'm going to do the same thing I did before. I'm going to draw a free body diagram for each one of these objects. And I'm going to make the same very, very important assumptions. The rope that connects the two is an action-reaction force. So the tension that is upward in the rope on the left-hand side is equal to the tension that is upward in the rope on the right-hand side. Really, all the pulley does is change the direction of the force that acts. Also, these two masses have the same acceleration. So here I have my two free body diagrams, and they're quite simple. The mass on the left-hand side of the, pulley, of the pulley I've called mass 1, and the mass on the right-hand side of the pulley I've called mass 2. It's very simple. Mass 1 has its own weight, M1G, acting downward, and the tension upward. Mass 2 has its own weight, M2G, acting downward, and the tension upward. The only thing I want to be careful about here is how I choose the signs when I apply Newton's second law. Since M2 is going to go downward, I'll choose downward to be positive for the M2 free body diagram. 
Since M1 is going to go upward, I'll choose upward to be the positive direction for the M1 free body diagram. Now here, I apply Newton's second law. The sum of all the forces is equal to the mass times the acceleration. For the free body diagram on the left, the tension is upward in the positive direction. So the tension minus M1g is equal to M1a. It's really important that I use M1 there because this is Newton's second law applied to the first free body diagram. Here again on the right, I have M2g acting downward in the positive direction. M2g minus the tension is equal to M2a. So these are the equations of motion and they form a linearly independent set of equations. They are a linear system. The tension and the acceleration appear in both equations and they're in principle unknown. The thing is, in this homework assignment, you're given information about the mass falling. Uh, it travels a distance, I think it's I think it's one meter. I don't even remember the diagram now, but it falls some distance in a certain amount of time. I wrote here my kinematic equation v squared is equal to v naught squared plus 2a delta x, thinking that's the one that I would use to solve the problem. But if the time is given, I'm probably going to use a little x is equal to x naught plus v zero t plus one half a t squared to find the acceleration. Once I know the acceleration, then I can use the equation on the left-hand side, t minus m1g equals m1a, to solve for the unknown mass m1. I'm going to have to do a little bit of algebra by adding m1g over to the right-hand side and factoring it out. Um, but I should come to the solution pretty quickly. But the tension still is unknown, so I will use the, the equation on the right uh, for the tension. At any rate, simultaneous solution where the two unknowns are the tension and M1.